It's great to be with you again this morning here in Clovis, New Mexico. I so appreciate Brother Joe Bunce and his sharing with us just a moment ago. I came to make sure I had time to hear him, and I appreciate his challenging and prophetic uh, message to us, to you. And uh, I can't believe he used the line out of Lonesome Dove. <laughs> My favorite line out of there is, Captain Woodrow, who said, I just can't tolerate rude behavior. <laughs> I've read every word. I've seen every movie, the prequel, the sequel, and the uh, Tanya is one of the finest I've ever seen. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I bring you greetings, New Mexico, from the Executive Committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. And Brother David, over here to my left-hand side, Brother David King serves and represents New Mexico well on the Executive Committee. What is the executive committee, you ask? Some of you don't ask and don't care, but you're going to hear anyway. It's a small organization, really. A staff of less than 30 people. Now that I'm there, it was bigger when I got there, but it's less than that now. Budget of less than $7 million. A decreasing budget, by the way, because we are decreasing our allocation to send more to the International Mission Board. We are purposefully doing more with less. We are getting leaner because we believe we can do more with less. And we are intentional in what we're doing. Now, what does it do? Its purpose is, first of all, to represent the work of the convention throughout the year. It's called in Latin, ad interim, which means the Southern Baptist Convention legally exists only two days a year. When we meet in annual session, that is when we legally exist, there legally is no Southern Baptist Convention right now. But the Constitution says that the Executive Committee, which is comprised of 83 men and women from across this land, like Brother David, they represent the work and the staff they hire, that's me and a few others. We do the work of the convention between the sessions, odd interim. And that work is coordinating work. And that work is keeping the entities pulling in the same direction, which is not always easy. It is also the work of public relations. We have Baptist Press, SBC Life, and you saw and heard about the e-version of the Baptist New Mexican. I ask you also to sign up for the free daily edition of Baptist Press, which is bpnews.net, and get all of your people to sign up for it. Thousands and thousands of people view it every day. It tells you what's going on in the world in missions. That's always the first and major column. Something going on in our world in mission work. And the right column is various things happening in the Baptist world. You'll see me a lot in there. And I would appreciate if you'd pray for me when you see my ugly face or my name. Because I need your prayers. And I would appreciate that. But get your people to sign up for bpnews.net. And that comes out of our office. We also have legal department because, unfortunately, we get sued regularly. And that is sad and sorry, but true. Uh, you know, for example, when Mrs. Jones bumps her toe in Turkey Trot, Alabama, she may have a third cousin who says, you know, I can get you some money. And you can go ahead and give that money right back to your church. He will sue First Baptist Turkey Trot, Alabama, and the local association, and the state convention, and the Southern Baptist Convention, trying to get money from every level. We live in a litigious society, and it makes me less than happy. <laughs> Spending God's money on some things like that. Well... If that's a lawyer calling, tell him, just get in line. <laughs> tell me what courtroom to meet him at. I'll be there. We also do the cooperative program promotion and development with our state partners. And that, for example, the video that came to you today from Dr. Luter, that was provided to your convention at no cost by the executive committee as we developed that and he did that for over 30 other conventions that requested a personalized message from Dr. Fred Luter. 
So we do corporate program work, legal work. We do public relations work. We also do what's called convention relations. Every day, somebody from around the world calls and says, how do we become Southern Baptist? Sometimes we get odd calls, like we'll get a call from a Lutheran church saying, listen, how much is the dues to that co-op y'all have got going? Because we've heard that if we join that co-op, then our people can go to your seminaries real cheap. So how much is your dues to that co-op? We have to say, well, we'd love to have you. Does that mean you're going to quit being Lutheran and start being bad? Oh, no, we just want to join that co-op. Well, we get calls like that, and then we get calls from the media virtually every day asking us what the Baptists believe about this or this, or what's our stance on this or this. And so we relate both internally to our people, but also externally to the outside world to help us put a better face and an accurate face on who we are and what we do. So we're a small organization. And uh, again, less than 30 employees and uh, we bring in, for example, our, our, our uh, executive committee members two times in Nashville, one time at the annual convention, and we do our work throughout the year. So pray for the executive committee. It's a small, but I think a pivotal organization. I also want to say again how much we uh, appreciate the work of New Mexico, and congratulations on your 100th anniversary. That's an exciting, exciting mark. And I so much like what, Joe, you said about that when your memories uh, transcend your, 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 your dreams, then you know the end is near. That uh, quote was powerful. Uh, and we must always appreciate the past, but never let it block the way to the future. Sunday morning, I preached in a church in South Carolina. I was asked over a year ago to go to this church. I know the pastor. I've been to the church before because I pastored near it. Now listen to the name. You think you got some good names in New Mexico? You do. I will tell you that. <laughs> but this was the Big Stevens Creek Baptist Church in North Augusta, South Carolina. Figure that one out. So I preached for the 250th anniversary of the Big Stevens Creek Baptist Church. When it was founded in 1762, there was no United States of America. It was against the law to preach the Baptist doctrine, they called it. South Carolina was an Anglican state, an English colony, and only the Anglican religion was allowed to be preached. And the pastor named Daniel Marshall, who planted churches all over the East, was highly criticized after he got that church started and established, he went across the river, the Savannah River, and started the oldest church in Georgia called the Kaoki. Yep, I said that. It's named after a creek that was named after an Indian tribe, the Kaoki Baptist Church in Appling, Georgia. Daniel Marshall was put into jail. Again, why? Georgia was a British colony. He was preaching, they said, an unlicensed gospel. And it is said, now this next story may or may not be true. It's somewhat apocryphal, which means it's a preacher's story and you've got to doubt it. <laughs> but it is said that at his trial, his wife, now it was his second wife, his first wife died in childbirth. His second wife was known to be a zealous woman. You know what that means, don't you, men? You just say, yes, ma'am, is all you say. She was a woman of zealous character, and it is said that at his trial that she spoke with such fervor and passion that both the jailer and the sheriff were converted on the spot, and Daniel Marshall was released to go preach other, to start other churches all over Georgia and all over the East. So, you've got a long history, but nothing like the big Stevens Creek Baptist Church. But what did I say to them? I said to them what I'm going to say to you today, but I want to begin with a story different than I used with them. I told you last night that in May of this year, I got to meet Billy Graham for the first time. And if you haven't read his autobiography, you ought to. It's entitled, Just As I Am. Isn't that appropriate for Billy Graham's autobiography? It's a big book. It's a thick read. Some of you take you about a year to do it, but you can do it. But I encourage you to try. And in it, he tells of a time years ago 
when he met then presidential candidate John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He said Kennedy had a deep appetite for spiritual things. And he said, Mr. Graham, tell me about the second coming of Jesus. In my church, a Roman Catholic church, I've never even heard it mentioned. I don't even know if my church believes it. Tell me about it, Mr. Graham. He said, I spent the better part of an hour telling him why Jesus came the first time and why and how he would come the second time. And he listened with great interest. And then Graham says, the next time I talked to him was actually several years later. He was then president of the United States. The occasion for that discussion was the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. And I, Billy Graham, was asked to lead it. And that's a big deal. I got to go to a Frank Page one time and sat in the back row. It was a big deal. But Billy Graham says the problem with me leading it that year was I think I had the flu. I was sick. I had aches and pains and chills. I had fever. I felt awful. But since it was such a big deal, I forced myself to go lead the National Prayer Breakfast. And as I was walking out, I found myself walking beside then President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He said, Mr. Graham, I need to ask a favor of you. What, Mr. President? Well, let me tell you, when the President asks you for a favor, you normally say, yes, sir. Mr. Graham, I need to talk to you today. Would you come back to the White House with me? I need to spend some time with you today, Mr. Graham. Billy Graham said, Mr. President, I don't feel good. Mr. Graham, I th Mr. President, I, I think I have the flu. I have aches and pains and chills. I have a fever. Mr. President, I would never want to give this to you. Could we talk some other time, Mr. President? Could we talk some other time? He looked at me and he said, Sure, Mr. Graham, that's okay. He gets you some rest. We'll talk some of the time. Billy Graham writes in his autobiography, Just As I Am, there was no other time. For less than three weeks later, an assassin's bullet cut short the life of that young president in Dallas, Texas. He said, I wish with all my heart and I will regret to the day I die. Now, Billy Graham is now 93, be 94 next month. He said, I'll regret to the day I die that I did not force myself to go talk to that young president. Maybe something I could have said could have changed his life for all eternity. And then Billy Graham uses a phrase. I'm going to tell you, my friends, it haunts me to this day. He said, for him and me that day, it became an irrecoverable moment. An irrecoverable moment. Now, friends, I believe that truth of an irrecoverable moment transcends any one person. I believe there are irrecoverable moments that come in the life of nations. I think we're at one right now. And I'm not sure we'll ever have a chance again. I, I believe with all my heart churches come to irrecoverable moments. And some of you are in churches that made a right decision and your church has been blessed and the kingdom of God has been blessed because of the decision that you made. And some of you are part of churches where a wrong decision was made. And people long for it to be back the way it was, but it can't get back there again. Some of you are in families and come from families like I do where a mom or a daddy made a decision a long time ago and your family was changed forever. And you wished as a child that it could go back the way it was. But it never was the same again, was it? Because of what mama did or daddy did or didn't do. Individuals can come to irrecoverable moments. Where God is doing a work in the life of a person, a boy, a girl, a man, a woman. And you can't be sure that it will ever come again. God's doing a work and you can make a decision. And yes, I do believe we have a free will to say yes or no to the urging of the Lord. And how many of my friends said no? Jesus predicted it, didn't he? He said, narrow is the way and straight is the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. But broad is the way and wide is the road that leads to destruction and many go that way. I believe conventions can come to irrecoverable moments. A time before you to make a decision. 
And I believe your executive director has prophetically set before you a vision today, one that will not be easy, Joe. One that will require everything you have to offer and more. I believe that your 100th anniversary celebration could be an irrecoverable moment. Now, there are stories in Scripture of men and women who made the right decision, praise the Lord. I love to preach the sermon. I preached it here in some time a while back. It was so good. I'm sure you all remember it. <laughs> Out of John chapter 4, where the woman at the well had an irrecoverable moment with Christ. But today I preach from the verse that I quoted last night. Four quick things today, and I'm not going to preach long, because I want you to remember these things. Out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The task before us. The whole point of this morning's session is considering the future. And your executive director has laid out a, a beautiful challenge for us today. Look with me back to that precious passage of Hebrews 12. And I quote it again from King James. Why? I'm not believe that's the only version. It's just the one I grew up with and the one I still memorize from. It's just easier for me. Wherefore, seeing we're encompassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God the Father. Four quick things. We have a marvelous heritage. We have a marvelous heritage. The writer of Hebrews, you know, most likely was pointing back to chapter 11. That great roll call of faith which lists men and women who stood strong for the Lord. Who did something to show that they had faith in God. They had faith, they had works. And the Bible affirms their spiritual heritage. I believe as New Mexico Baptists we must affirm that we too have a marvelous heritage. This was not an easy place to live in once upon a time, and it may not be still for many. But men and women came to this place and worked hard in the land and brought industry and, and agriculture and brought uh, all kinds of prosperity and worked hard. People from many countries have come to this place from many traditions and have worked hard to make New Mexico a great state. We have a marvelous heritage. We must always be aware of those who've gone before us and never stop appreciating our history. I'm real big, as maybe you could tell from my uh, big Stevens Creek Baptist Church. See, I knew more of that than they did. I had to tell them some things about Daniel Marshall they didn't even know. I love history. I appreciate it. I believe we need to always revere those who have sacrificed, who've gone before us. We have a marvelous heritage as believers. We can realize that there are those who've gone on before us and from heaven's grandstand, they're looking upon us. I don't know if God lets them see everything, but maybe he lets them see some of it. To say, keep going, I've been there. Keep on, I, I'll help you. I'm with you. Friends, we have a marvelous heritage and we desperately need to remember those have gone on before us. Seeing we are encompassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses. The Bible says, second, we have a marked responsibility. We have a marked responsibility. What does it say? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. I believe God calls us into a partnership with him. And he says, I'm going to help you, but you've got to do some things yourself. And I want you to live a life that's right. And I want you to lay aside that which does not belong. Now I believe this even speaks to conventions and churches. Because I, what he's saying there first of all is we've got to lay aside every weight. Now ever again, uh, again, most people reading this passage in a commentary see that the writers say that he's referring to training weights. That when a runner is training to run, they put training weights on so they can strengthen their muscles so that when he or she comes to the day of the race, they take the training weights off, they can run faster and stronger. There are things sometimes that hold us back on the day of the race. I believe it is incumbent upon every church 
every convention to say, you know, maybe we need to take a look and see what we're doing. It may be something we were doing back yonder we don't need to do now. Maybe it doesn't work anymore. And if there's one thing Baptists like to hang on to, it's everything that we used to do. Somebody once said, if culture ever reverts back to the 50s and 60s, we're ready. We're ready. Because we haven't changed nothing since the 50s and 60s. I grew up, now OS talked about it yesterday, he's a lot older than I am. I grew up in the 60s like your executive director. And I liked it. Because that's what I'm familiar with. But let me tell you something, friends. Just like he said, the message never changes, but the methods do. And to reach people in the 21st century, we've got to understand new methods are necessary. But unfortunately, some of the churches I visit would rather see their entire neighborhood die and go straight to a burning, Christless hell than do change anything. Not going to change my music. I like my music. Not going to change my methods. I like them. And the neighborhoods are dying and going straight to the pits of hell. It's okay to have opinions. It's okay to like certain things. It really is. I do too. But friends, let me tell you something. We have a marked responsibility to lay everything aside that holds us back. But there is sin that has to be dealt with too. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, whoever the writer was, I don't know. Might have been Paul, might have been Apollos, I don't know. But that writer says, let us lay aside every sin and the sin that doth so easily beset us. Old writers talk about besetting sins. The truth is every one of us struggle with something more than we struggle with anything else. Now Jesus said, let me tell you how to deal with it. Cut it out. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Now aren't we thankful that Jesus was speaking metaphorically? Or else we'd have a lot of one-eyed, one-handed Baptists running around. But what he said was, deal with it seriously. Surgically excise that which does not belong in your walk in the Lord. We have our marked responsibility to live righteously before him. Let me tell you something. New Mexicans are desperately watching believers. Wanting to see, are they different? Are they really different? And they're watching to see in your neighborhood, in your community. They're watching to see, is it true? You see, lost people really believe in their heart it's true. And they want verification. We have a marked responsibility. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. But third, quickly hear me today. We have a mission. We have a mission. The writer of Hebrews says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, he knew, because this is, this is guided by the Holy Spirit, that we'd be working with people. That's why you got the phrase with patience in there. He knew we'd be working with hard-headed folks. That's why it says we've got to run the race with patience. Because people sometimes cause trouble. Jesus set out his great plan for the church in Matthew 16. Not two chapters later, he talked about how to get along in the church. He talked about how to deal with conflict in the church. Not two chapters after he founded it. He knew that problems would always come every time you deal with people. Friends, we have a mission. There is a race that is set before us. And he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I believe God has a plan for New Mexico. Amen. I believe God has a plan for this convention, for your church, and for your life. I believe the words of Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. 
I believe there is a plan for you, and I believe God has envisioned greatness that your next hundred years, unless Jesus comes, will be by far the greatest in the history of this state. And the unparalleled lostness of state can be impacted by on fire believers and on fire churches. I love the words of old Landrum Level. Now, he was from deep south, and you have to understand the terminology. He said, I want you so excited in the Lord that when you leave this place, that if a mosquito, you probably don't have many of those around here, but you know what a mosquito is, don't you? He said, if a mosquito was to bite you, it's going to have to go away singing, there's power in the blood, there's power in the blood. <laughs> now, up this high, you don't have many of them, but you know what I mean. Let me tell you something, friends. There's a race that is set before us, and God wants us to reach people and get excited about it once again. But I'm afraid. I see less personal evangelism going on now than I've ever seen in my life. And I see less personal evangelism going on amongst pastors than I've ever seen in my life. And, friends, I'm deeply burdened about the lack, the dearth of evangelism. We have adopted a lie. That people won't talk to you anymore about Christ. Now there's some truth to the fact that they're pretty upset about churches. I'll never forget. I've got to tell you a quick story. But I'm a, I try to make it quick. I have a spiritual gift. My wife says my primary spiritual gift is irritation. <laughs> my second gift is making short stories long. I'm going to fight it. But let me tell you something. People say people won't talk to you more about the Lord. Years ago, I pastored in Augusta, Georgia, right across North Augusta, South Carolina. You with me? That's how I know about the big Stevens Creek Baptist Church. A family in the church called me one day and said, Pastor, would you pray for our nephew Stephen? He's a young man. He's lost. He's an alcoholic. He's angry. And we just need, would you pray with us uh, for him? Yes, I will. So I began praying for Stephen. It wasn't long. I, I just felt the Lord lead me to go talk to the boy. I asked for his, direct, his address. They gave it to me. I went to his house. He wasn't there. I left my card. He called his aunt back the next day and said, You tell that man never to come to my house ever again. I know where his church is, and if I ever want to go, I'll go. That wasn't very sweet, was it? Now, there's a few folks in New Mexico like that, by the way. You know what she told Stephen? She said, well, Stephen, I'll, I'll tell him, but I doubt it'll do any good. <laughs> you remember my first spiritual gift? Next week, guess where I was? <laughs> Knocking on his door. He wouldn't come to the door. He was at home. Can you imagine not answering the door for a face like mine? <laughs> it took me days to get that boy on the phone. I mean, he just was avoiding me. I finally got him on the phone. I said, Stephen. This is Frank Page. I know who you are. I said, son, you don't need to run from me. I said, he said, I'm not running from you. I said, yes, boy, you are. Don't run from me. <laughs> he said, well, I know where your church is. Me, 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 me. He went on. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out, son. Do you think I was going to talk to you about church? He said, yes. I said, I wasn't even going to mention the church. Now, I love the church, but I wasn't going to talk to you about the church at this point. What you going to talk about? Stephen, son, I just want to talk to you about Jesus. I love Jesus, son, and I want you to know him. Would you talk to me about Jesus, Stephen? Yeah, I'll talk to you about Jesus. So we began talking about Jesus. I took him to lunch. He would never come to Christ. I'm telling you, he would not give his life to Christ. He was so angry, so lost. But listen to me, New Mexico Baptist. I loved him as a lost person. We became friends. I would have done anything for that boy. He called me that when his wife had their two baby girls, called me both times from the delivery room. Years went by. I prayed for him every day. I called him the last Saturday of every month. By the way, I still do. Pray for him and call him. Years went by. I never let up. But let me tell you something, friends. The race that was before him was getting hard because he just wouldn't give his life to Christ. You heard Joe say, don't give up. Years go by, I moved to another state. I moved across the river to South Carolina, way up at the top of the state. 
Of course, Georgia and South Carolina are not as big as this state. But anyway, I was up there. Finally, I was so proud of him, he started going to a Bible study. Started going to a Bible study. Now, he was still Stephen. He was still angry. He was still rough. Now, he wouldn't go to a church, so they had it in a pickup truck shop that makes monster trucks. You got them out here. I mean, his red neck, let me tell you something. He said, Dr. Page, you proud of me? I'm going to a Bible study. Some of my friends invited me. I said, yes, son, I'm proud of you. He said, we're studying a book called Thessalonians. You ever heard of it? I said, yes, son, I've heard of Thessalonians. He said, it's got some good stuff in it. I said, Stephen, son, I've been telling you that for 16, now 16 years. Then he called me back some weeks later. Dr. Page, what? He said, I've never asked you for anything, have I? No, you haven't, son. What do you want? I want you to come to my Bible study next Wednesday morning in Augusta, Georgia at 7 o'clock. I said, I'll be there. And I had changed some things around, but I was there. Here I am sitting in this redneck pickup truck shop at 7 o'clock in the morning studying Thessalonians. And I'm wondering, what in the world? You know, I'd been praying for him, but he called me out about halfway through. He said, come outside with me, Dr. Page. Dr. Page, I want to give my life to Christ today. Oh, son, I've been praying for this for 16 years, son. I'm sorry it's taken me so long. He said, can I do it here? Do I have to go to your church and do it on Sunday? I said, son, let me tell you, we can do it right here. Now, you remember, Stephen, here's what it means. I went through the gospel again. He said, I know, I know. You've told me 150 times. I'm mean, let me tell you something. I see you would him. I eat him. I faithed him. I, I Jesus without feared him. I did every I'd done everything I could do. But then he said the strangest thing. He said, Dr. Page, can I do it in there in front of my friends? I said, Oh yeah, you can. So I went in, I literally, and I, I promise you I did this. I said, Rednecks, I'm sorry to interrupt your redneck Bible study. Now, see, I can do that because I am a redneck with a Ph.D. I said, sorry to interrupt your redneck Bible study, but this friend, Stephen, and you know him, he's hard-headed. But you have loved him unconditionally. And he wants to be saved. Well, those rednecks started crying and shouting. And he prayed one of the sweetest prayers you've ever heard in your life. Let me tell you something, friends. People talk to you about Jesus. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. God has a plan. Satan has a plan for this convention also, by the way. Satan has a plan for your church. I get a lot of calls from pulpit committees asking me to help them out. And I try to. But I, one of the things I say is, do you know Satan has a plan for your church? Well, we haven't really thought about it. Well, you better think about it. And how could he see it accomplished? He has a plan. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your family. He has a plan for your convention. He has a plan for the Southern Baptist Convention. Let us run with patience the race that God has set before us. Friends, let me tell you quickly. I believe, I guess I'm just an old-timey conservative fundamentalist. You can call me whatever you want to call me. But I believe every word of the Bible is supposed to be in there. And there's a word in there I want to remind you of this morning. It's called us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I truly believe that which we do best, we do together. That's right. Let me tell you something. New Mexicans years ago learned they had to have friends out on the prairie. They had to have friends they could count on when the troubles came and they did come. Baptist, God's people need to remember that same thing. We should never attempt to do Lone Ranger Christianity. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We have a mission. And you've heard it clearly enumerated tonight, today. But last, quickly, it's all because we have a master. It's not because we want to be better New Mexico Baptists. It's not because we need to be better Southern Baptists. It's because Jesus is watching. It's because Jesus cares. We have a master. 
We have a master, and I'll tell you, I believe he was prophetically predicted. I believe he was virgin born. I believe he was pure living. I believe he was vicarious dying. I believe he was bodily resurrected. I believe he was gloriously ascended. I believe he is presently interceding, and I believe he is soon to return, our Lord Jesus. And let me tell you, we have a master looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that started it all, and he's the one that's going to end it all. And it's not about being a better Baptist. It's about being a better Jesus man or a Jesus woman. And what did he do? Who for the joy that was set before him, he had all of heaven at his disposal. He endured the cross. He died in my place. He died in your place, enduring the cross, despising its shame. And there was shame at the cross. My shame and your shame. But he is now set down at the right hand of God the Father. We have a master. Let's be a Jesus convention. Let's be a Jesus church. Let's be a Jesus husband and wife and man and woman. Let's be Jesus people. I believe we've come to an irrecoverable moment. And we need to remember that we have a marvelous heritage. We have a marked responsibility. We have a mission because we have a master. And all God's people said,